Hi there. In today's video, you're going to learn 12 conversational English phrases that you can use to sound more fluent, more natural, and more professional. We're going to listen to a short clip of Sheryl Sandberg, the former COO of Facebook, talking about women in leadership. Then we're going to learn some of the conversational English phrases she uses so that you can use them too. First, we'll listen to the whole video clip without subtitles, so you can try to understand as much of the English as you can. Then we'll listen to it again with subtitles, and I'll explain how you can use each new word or phrase fluently and naturally. Sound good? Then let's get started. Looking back on my childhood, I worry that I was a little bossy. I think as a boy, I would have thought I was a leader. And as a girl, I thought I was a little bossy. And I think we need to change that if we want more women in leadership. I spent most of my career, including my time at McKinsey, never acknowledging that I was a woman. And, you know, fast forward, I'm 43 now, and fitting in is not helping us. You know, women have been 14% of the top jobs in this country for 10 years. No progress. And so I really believe that we need a new and much more honest and open dialogue on gender. I left McKinsey. I went into the government. I was in the government for four years. And then I moved out to Silicon Valley and I went to Google. And it took me a year leaving Treasury to get a job. By the time I got my job at Google and took it, I was so happy to have employment that I was no longer afraid. I just wanted to start. I started out with a team of four people and I wound up with a team of 4,000. So for the first time, I really managed a large group of people. And what I found was even working for me over the years, the men did better than the women. And I watched this happen and at every stage, the men were in my office, in my, in my face, I want the next job. We're opening an office in India, I want to do it. You know, and the women, when I tried to talk them into that, you really need a new role. I'm still learning. You really should think about doing something else. I'm not sure I'm qualified for that job. Sentences I never heard from the men. If you drill into the data, study after study shows exactly the same thing, which is that starting in junior high, if you ask boys and girls, do you want to lead? Lead your high school class, lead your junior high school class, lead your club in college, lead the organization, team, or company you join as an adult, more men than women want that. All the studies show this. And that's how we get to a world where 14% of the top corporate jobs are held by women. We need to encourage women to lead. And we don't do that. No one can have it all. That language is the worst thing that's happened to the women's movement. You know, no one even bothers to apply it to men. It's really pressure on women. I think what happens to women is we compare ourselves at home to the women who are full-time work-at-home mothers. And we fall short. Compared to them, I am falling short every day. And then you can compare yourself at work. To the, to the men, mostly men, but some women, but mostly men, who have no other responsibilities really. Go home whenever they want, and you can feel bad there too. So we can spend all our time feeling terrible about how we're lousy workers and lousy mothers. And by the way, I do this a lot, all of us do. Or we can start realizing that we can be great mothers. The data on this is super clear that you can be a great and very successful parent with a great relationship with thriving children with less time. And you can be a great worker and a great colleague at work but not have to be there for 12 hours a day in person. And I think we have to let ourselves do that. I sit here today not having a comfortable relationship with power, ambition, or leadership. You know, for men, leadership, power, ambition are unambiguously good words. As men get more successful, lead more, they're better liked. For women, those things are not encouraged and actually actively discouraged because all of us, men and women alike, we dislike women who are more successful. At Facebook, the last performance review cycle, a man came to me and was talking about his team. And he said there's a senior woman on his team that he got feedback that she was too aggressive. So rather than do what most people do, write down too aggressive, not ready for promotion, needs to get along better with peers. That's the feedback most women get. He went back and he went to the people who gave that feedback and he sat down with them. He said, I want to ask you a question and be honest about it. Let's talk about what this woman did. If she were a man, would that have been too aggressive? And to a one, they all said no. And we can change this. If we start associating leadership qualities with women, it will become less of an anomaly, and we won't have these stereotype threats that hold us back. I think it's really important that both men and women, but particularly women, because they have a harder time finding them, get mentors and sponsors at work. Really important. 
I think it's also really important that we start making it a badge of honor for men and women to mentor and sponsor women. I think we need to help women understand that they will build the mentor and sponsorship relationships they need substantively. I am much more likely to go ask someone to have coffee when I have a real thing to talk about, not just to have coffee. Now, maybe that makes me less fun and I love to have coffee more often, but I do think the best relationships at work are built based on substance, working together, doing a real project together. And so when I talk to people about helping them form relationships, I ask them things like, well, if you want a relationship with that person, how can you help her? How can you help him? How can you help your team? All right, and that was Cheryl Sandberg. As usual, if you found the video a little difficult to understand, you can go back and listen to it one more time. You can even listen to it at a slower speed, which some people find helpful. Otherwise, let's watch the video again together, this time with subtitles, and I'll show you how you can use the phrases that Sheryl Sandberg uses in a fluent and natural way. All right, let's listen again. Looking back at my childhood, I worry that I was a little bossy. I think as a boy, I would have thought I was a leader. And as a girl, I thought I was a little bossy. And I think we need to change that if we want more women in leadership. I spent most of my career, including my time at McKinsey, never acknowledging that I was a woman. And you know, fast forward, I'm 43 now, and fitting in is not helping us. Fast forward. The phrase fast forward is often said when you're using a remote control to skip forward during a TV program. In other words, you quickly skip ahead. In this conversation, Sheryl Sandberg is talking about her history as a woman in the business world. When she was young, there weren't many women in leadership. And then fast forward, in other words, skipping forward until now, and there still aren't very many women in leadership. In a professional situation, you could say, I started at this company as an intern, fast forward 20 years, and now I'm a senior vice president. All right, fast forward. Let's continue. You know, women have been 14% of the top jobs in this country for 10 years. No progress. And so I really believe that we need a new and much more honest and open dialogue on gender. I left McKinsey, I went into the government, I was in the government for four years, and then I moved out to Silicon Valley and I went to Google. And it took me a year leaving Treasury to get a job. By the time I got my job at Google and took it, I was so happy to have employment that I was no longer afraid, I just wanted to start. I started out with a team of four people and I wound up with a team of 4,000. Wind up with. When you wind up in a particular situation, you come to be in a situation that is different from what you expected. So in this clip, for example, Sheryl Sandberg says that she started working with a small team and wound up with a very large team. In other words, her team eventually became very large, probably larger than she had expected. In a professional situation, you can say, our project didn't start off very well, but we eventually wound up getting good results. Okay, wind up. Let's continue. So for the first time, I really managed a large group of people. And what I found was even working for me over the years, the men did better than the women. And I watched this happen and at every stage, the men were in my office, in my, in my face. In someone's face. When someone is in your face, they are very direct and impossible to ignore. You can imagine someone standing right in front of you, almost like they're literally in your face. In this clip, Sheryl Sandberg means that the men at her company were very direct and aggressive in trying to develop themselves. They were in her face asking her for more challenging assignments. All right, in someone's face. Let's continue. I want the next job. We're opening an office in India. I want to do it. You know, and the women, when I tried to talk them into that. Talk someone into something. When you talk someone into something, you convince them or persuade them to do something. You use reasons or arguments to change their mind about something. So, for example, 
Maybe you want to vacation in Thailand, but your friend wants to vacation in France. You might try to talk your friend into vacationing in Thailand by showing her pictures of how beautiful Thai beaches are or how nice the hotels there are. You're trying to convince her to vacation in Thailand instead of France. In a professional setting, you could say, I was behind schedule on this project, but I was able to talk my boss into giving me more time to finish it. All right, talk someone into something. Let's continue. You really need a new role. I'm still learning. You really should think about doing something else. I'm not sure I'm qualified for that job. Sentences I never heard from the men. If you drill into the data, study after study shows exactly the same thing, which is that starting in junior high, if you ask boys and girls, do you want to lead? Lead your high school class, lead your junior high school class, lead your club in college, lead the organization, team, or company you join as an adult, more men than women want that. Okay, I wanted to clarify a few words that Sheryl Sandberg uses here. She mentions a few words, junior high, high school, and college, which refers to the education system in the United States. Junior high, or junior high school, is also sometimes called middle school. It generally refers to grades seven and eight, sometimes grades seven to nine. High school is generally grades nine to 12. After you finish high school, you can go to college. Now, when you hear the word college in the United States, it usually means university. And I say this because in some countries, people think of college as being lower than university in some way. But in the United States, when you hear people talking about going to college, they're generally talking about going to university. They might have graduated from Harvard, and they'll still say, I went to college at Harvard. Okay, let's continue. Lead your high school class, lead your junior high school class, lead your club in college, lead the organization, team, or company you join as an adult. More men than women want that. All the studies show this. And that's how we get to a world where 14% of the top corporate jobs are held by women. We need to encourage women to lead. And we don't do that. No one can have it all. That language is the worst thing that's happened to the women's movement. No one can have it all. Or another common expression is, you can't have it all. When you say that you can't have it all, you mean that it's impossible to be successful in every area of your personal and professional life at the same time. So for example, you're probably not going to have a job that you love and make a lot of money and have a lot of time off to spend with your family and friends and have very little stress. You're not going to have everything you might want at the same time. You have to make choices depending on what's most important to you. That's what we mean when we say that you can't have it all. All right? Can't have it all. Let's continue. You know, no one even bothers to apply it to men. It's really pressure on women. I think what happens to women is we compare ourselves at home to the women who are full-time work-at-home mothers, and we fall short. Compared to them, I am falling short every day. Fall short. When you fall short, you don't reach a certain target, or you fail to meet a certain standard. For example, maybe you were trying to meet a sales target that your manager set for you, but you fell short, meaning that you didn't make your target. In this talk, Sheryl Sandberg is talking about the feeling of falling short as a parent because you work a lot and you don't have a lot of time for your kids. Or you feel like you're falling short at work because you have a family and can't spend all of your time working. In a professional situation, you could say, our sales this quarter fell short of our targets, so we might need to rethink our strategy. All right, fall short. Let's continue. And then you can compare yourself at work to the, to the men, mostly men, but some women, but mostly men, who have no other responsibilities really. Go home whenever they want, and you can feel bad there too. So we can spend all our time feeling terrible about how we're lousy workers and lousy mothers. Lousy. The word lousy is a non-formal word that just means very bad. 
you can use it for a lot of things. So for example, Sheryl Sandberg is talking about feeling like a lousy parent, meaning that you feel like you're not a very good parent. But you can also talk about a restaurant having lousy food or lousy service. If you're a little sick, you could say that you feel lousy. In a professional situation, you might say something like, I had such a lousy weekend, I'm actually happy to be back at work. All right, lousy. Let's continue. And by the way, I do this a lot, all of us do. Or we can start realizing that we can be great mothers. The data on this is super clear that you can be a great and very successful parent with a great relationship with thriving children with less time. And you can be a great worker and a great colleague at work, but not have to be there for 12 hours a day in person. And I think we have to let ourselves do that. I sit here today not having a comfortable relationship with power, ambition, or leadership. You know, for men, leadership, power, ambition are unambiguously good words. Ambiguous or unambiguous. The word ambiguous is a pretty advanced English word, but it really just means that something has more than one meaning. Something isn't totally clear because it has more than one meaning. So, for example, in a professional context, you could say that the way a contract is written makes the contract somewhat ambiguous. In other words, the contract isn't entirely clear because the way it is written can mean more than one thing. You can also say that something is unambiguous, which means the opposite. When something is unambiguous, it's completely clear. There's only one possible meaning. In a professional situation, you could say, the instructions for the project were ambiguous, so the team wasn't really sure how to start. All right, ambiguous. Let's continue. As men get more successful, lead more, they're better liked. For women, those things are not encouraged and actually actively discouraged because all of us, men and women alike, we dislike women who are more successful. At Facebook, the last performance review cycle, a man came to me and was talking about his team. And he said there's a senior woman on his team, but he got feedback that she was too aggressive. So rather than do what most people do, write down too aggressive, not ready for promotion, needs to get along better with peer. Peer. Your peer is someone who has the same status or the same position as you do. Often, your peer is someone who is about the same age, has the same level of education, and perhaps a similar level of income. In a professional context, your peers are the people who have a similar role or position within your company or your industry. For example, if you're an assistant manager, a vice president is not your peer. Your peers would be other junior level managers. In a professional situation, you could say, as a new manager, he was eager to learn from his peers in other departments. All right, peer. Let's continue. That's the feedback most women get. He went back and he went to the people who gave that feedback and he sat down with them. He said, I want to ask you a question and be honest about it. Let's talk about what this woman did. If she were a man, would that have been too aggressive? And to a one, they all said no. And we can change this. If we start associating leadership qualities with women, it will become less of an anomaly and we won't have these stereotype threats that hold us back. I think it's really important that both men and women, but particularly women, because they have a harder time finding them, get mentors and sponsors at work. Really important. I think it's also really important that we start making it a badge of honor for men and women to mentor and sponsor women. Badge of honor. When you wear something as a badge of honor, you are expressing pride in something special that you've accomplished. For example, maybe you were the first person in your family to go to university, and that's something you wear as a badge of honor. Originally, a badge of honor was an actual badge, like a military badge, that you received for a special accomplishment. These days, when we talk about a badge of honor, we don't mean an actual physical badge. We mean a feeling of pride in something special we've done. In this clip, Sheryl Sandberg says that it would be great 
if people felt it to be a badge of honor to mentor and support women in business. It's something that's important and that you should feel proud about. All right, badge of honor. Let's finish listening to the video. I think we need to help women understand that they will build the mentor and sponsorship relationships they need substantively. I am much more likely to go ask someone to have coffee when I have a real thing to talk about, not just to have coffee. Now, maybe that makes me less fun and I love to have coffee more often, but I do think the best relationships at work are built based on substance, working together, doing a real project together. And so when I talk to people about helping them form relationships, I ask them things like, well, if you want a relationship with that person, how can you help her? How can you help him? How can you help your team? All right, and those were 12 common conversational English words and phrases that fluent English speakers use in spoken English. Now, here's a little assignment for you. I want you to take each word or phrase we learned today, and I want you to think of a sentence you could use in a real situation in your own life. For example, take the phrase fit in. What is a real situation in which you could use the phrase fit in? Or the phrase fall short? Or any of the other phrases we learned today? Imagine a real situation and then imagine saying something in that situation using a new phrase. Practicing English in your imagination in this way is actually an effective way to improve your English speaking. Just be sure that you imagine the situation very clearly. All right, and that's all for today's lesson. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. You can also share the video with others you think would benefit from it. Thank you for watching. I'll talk to you next time.